Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering the Employee Tax Retention Credit or ERC. We're going to go over the latest guidance. I'm Lauren Thompson, Partner Marketing Manager here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a full suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge techno technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service, and deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. We will be sending out the recording of the webinar later today, along with the slides. I'm excited to introduce your presenters for today's program. Paul Corellis, VP of HR Services at MP, and Mike Torrielli, Vice President and Customer Experience Manager at North Shore Bank. And with that, I'm gonna hand the presentation off to Paul and Mike for their introductions. Great, thank you. Mike, I'll let you take it away. Excellent, thank you, Lauren and Paul. Um, again, my name is Mike Torrielli. I am the uh, Vice President and uh, Customer Experience Manager here at North Shore Bank. Um, for those that, that uh, are not familiar with North Shore Bank, we um, have been here in our community, serving our communities, providing banking services for over 135 years throughout the North Shore. Um, we are a, a well-capitalized community bank, and we're very, very committed to our local communities and to developing strong customer relationships. Um, we're supported by a growing network of offices, and our customers find great convenience dealing with a local institution, which is willing to meet their needs um, where they want to bank, when they want to bank. We're super excited to be uh, teaming up with MP. Um, <clears throat> it's very important to us when we're looking to partner with other companies that they share the same values as we do. Um, when we were looking to partner with a payroll and HR services company, there were really no shortage of, shortage of options. However, MP was a perfect fit for us. Um, also locally owned and based, um, MP shares the same local community values that we share at North Shore Bank. So really our partnership uh, was uh, was a, a perfect fit for both, both companies, I believe. And um, we're uh, super excited to be partnering up with them on um, ERC. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Mike. Really excited uh, about working with North Shore Bank in this capacity and really looking forward to talking about this topic. Uh, it remains a really hot one. A lot of businesses, you know, have, have been called, emailed, um, seen ads on TV, on radio, just getting hit, you know, everywhere from, from ERTC. But a lot of times those those marketing campaigns kind of fail to, to dig into the details. And it's, it's really a lot of times hard to determine whether or not your business will be able to take advantage of this. And certainly the IRS has, has made it very clear that they don't want people filing unless they're, unless they're truly eligible. And certainly there have been some, some bad actors out there in terms of, of companies being overly aggressive with their clients and their clients claims. Um, so really, what we want to do today is help educate you, empower you, let you know what to look for um, when you're considering your potential eligibility and um, what to look for in a partner as well. We'll also give you the latest and greatest in terms of the IRS guidance, especially what came out last week. So um, let you know our, our thoughts on that and the current status of the program. But otherwise, let's let's dig right in. As Lauren said, please do feel free to use the Q&A feature. Um, if you have any questions, you know, whether it's company specific or just general about the program or how it all works, feel free to throw those in the Q&A and I'll make sure we get to as many of those as we can before the end of the session today. All right, so let's start off kind of by talking about the history of the employee retention credit program. Um, we'll use terms ERTC and ERC interchangeably here. They both stand for the, the same thing, the employee retention credit or the employee retention tax credit. So 
this program was born in the very first stimulus bill when we were in the the real throes of the pandemic back in 2020. So uh, probably remember that Congress acted quickly, especially by congressional standards, to pass some some stimulus for people, businesses, and the like. Why there wasn't a lot of traction with the ERC program early on was because of PPP loans or Paycheck Protection Program. Um, many businesses obviously took advantage of those. It was a, a, a great way to provide stimulus to those businesses that really needed um, that infusion of, of money in order to keep employees on payroll and keep them paid. The problem was that in the original stimulus bill, um, the way that it was written, required that businesses take advantage of one program or the other. So businesses could either take advantage of PPP or ERTC. They were not allowed to do both. Um, and in the language for ERTC, in this original stimulus bill, it was just a program for 2020 and limited to $5,000 per employee total. The game really changed um, upon the passage of the second stimulus bill, which was in late 2020, late December of 2020. So a couple of key things when it comes to this program that were altered through that second stimulus bill. First, uh, it did pave the way for businesses to take advantage of both ERTC and PPP. PPP borrowers were no longer prohibited from participating in ERC. Uh, they just had to be careful not to double dip, not to claim ERC on wages that were paid with PPP funds. We'll get into that in a little bit. It also created the ERTC program for, for 2021 as well. And we'll, it is fairly different than the 2020 program. We'll get into those differences shortly, um, but it, it essentially paved the way for um, a longer runway for this program to go. Then the third stimulus bill, also known as the American Rescue Plan or ARPA, further extended the ERTC program. So the second stimulus bill created ERTC for quarters one and two of 2021. ARPA created ERC for quarters three and quarter four of 2021. Um, in one of the uh, compromise bills that passed subsequently in 2022, um, they did remove quarter four from uh, from the ERC program. So um, quarter four of 2021 is no longer a part of ERC, um, but uh, up to quarter three of 2021 is. They also, through ARPA, created a couple of additional uh, programs under ERC, one for severely distressed companies. So that's for companies who even into 2021 were still down, you know, upwards of 90% in terms of their gross receipts compared to quarters in 2019 pre-pandemic. Uh, that gi it gives them uh, additional eligibility for funds if for businesses in that category. Um, that one was really for businesses such as the cruise cruise ship industry and things like that, where the restrictions were were severe and, and long lasting more than uh, than most others. They also created the category of recovery startup business. So this was an interesting one, and we have been able to have several clients take advantage of this. So the recovery startup category is for businesses who started February fifteenth of 2020 or later. So they they started the business um, essentially during the pandemic or as it was just starting or during, during COVID-19. Um, for those businesses, they have a special eligibility uh, for quarter three. And these are, this is the one group of businesses that is eligible to get ERTC for quarter four of 2021. So um, these businesses have a special eligibility category of those two quarters. Um, they don't have to meet the other eligibility guidelines that we'll be talking about. There is a cap on, on how much of a credit recovery startup businesses can get, but essentially if they started during that time period and are of the right size and um, right limitations in terms of annual revenues, then uh, that's a great program too. ARPA did also clarify a, a five-year statute of, of limitations. So, um, in terms of deadlines for the ERTC program, what we're looking at is the 2020 program um, to file an ERTC that pertains to the 2020 tax year. Those are going to have to be filed by April of 2024. 
Uh, the 2021 ERTC program is going to need to be filed by April of 2025. Um, the IRS did also give itself a, a five-year window to review any ERTC claims. So again, just to dissuade any, any fraudulent activity, they are reserving the right to take a look at these even after they're refunded. Uh, lastly, ARPA clarified within the ERTC program that um, Businesses that took advantage of restaurant revitalization funding or shuttered venues grants, um, they're still eligible to participate in the RTC. They just, again, can't double dip on funds that they received uh, within those programs. IRS has also done a, a fairly good job of issuing guidance and, and guides and scenarios when it comes to this program in an effort to help businesses really learn whether or not they have eligibility and if so, for what time period. So um, they've, over the past few, three years, released hundreds and hundreds of pages of guidance. Um, our team at MP has, has reviewed the guidance, um, asked lots of questions of the IRS and feel like we have a pretty good handle on, on where the bar is in terms of what the IRS considers eligible or not. Um, but to aid us further in that, through IRS guidance over the last few years, you know, some some things that when the program first launched weren't really clear, but they have added clarification to. First is what's known as the partial suspension suspension of operations, and really what qualifies as more than nominal when you're considering how much your business was disrupted by a COVID-related mandate, rule, restriction, or law. So the IRS is mathematically defining that as uh, what they call the 10% rule, which means that in order for something to be considered more than nominal within your business, either 10% of your gross receipts in 2019 um, would have been accounted by whatever that part of your business was, or 10% of the man hours. So if we're looking for a real world example of that, if we say, look at a restaurant, um, restaurants were allowed to operate um, for most of the pandemic, but for a large chunk of time, and this varied state by state, um, there were restrictions on the dining room and what percentage uh, of the dining room could be filled with patrons. So that was the, the portion of the business that was um, impacted and restricted and partially suspended by COVID regulations. So when you look at that, the question that we would have for the restaurant would be, um, were at least 10% of your gross receipts prior to the pandemic or 10% of your man hours devoted to um, that in, in person dining. Were you strictly takeout with no tables and no ability for people to consume the food on site or did at least 10% of the business dine in? IRS also created some clarity which wasn't present at the beginning of the program in terms of how to claim the credits. Uh, and really that you can't unfortunately just lump all your eligible quarters together and submit that on one amended return. They do need to be separated out by quarter. Um, they also have to be claimed via a 941X, especially now for businesses that were really proactive with it and able to claim the credit on the actual quarter. Um, there was the opportunity to throw it on, on the 941 form, but um, that's long since passed. So at this point, everything is done via amendments. They have also provided really valuable knowledge in terms of owner wages. So basically anyone who owns more than half of a company as well as their family members are excluded as, as eligible recipients of, of the credit as employees themselves. So if you have, um, say, a, a person who owns 75% of a business, their wages cannot be counted towards the credit, nor if they have any family members on the payroll, we can't count them for credits either, but every other employee is okay if they're otherwise eligible. There are also aggregation rules. So for, for people who own multiple businesses, um, if under these IRS rules, um, there's a control group situation or controlled ownership um, to the levels set forth by the IRS, then we need to aggregate those businesses. So that can be a good thing or a bad thing. So the aggregation is is pretty full. So you, you have to aggregate things such as the size of the company in terms of employee count. You also have, have to aggregate the gross receipts, um, which can be good or bad. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not so good, but 
Um, one area where it can be really helpful for a business is that you also get to aggregate the restrictions. So if you have, let's say, two very di different businesses, again, we'll, we'll use the example of a restaurant. So let's say someone owns a restaurant and they also own um, an insurance company, let's say. Um, this person owns 100% of both, so it is a control group. Those restaurant restrictions, can, uh, provided that when you aggregate all the revenues um, and the employees, if at least 10% of, of those revenues were part of that affected dining room restriction, um, that person can claim ERTC credits on their entire control group. So that includes the employees of the insurance agency as well. Now, obviously, these are all on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, if any of these things sound like uh, they may fit into your situation, certainly we'd be happy to talk to you and, and talk about the specifics and the details. Um, this is just kind of generally how this the program works. Another thing that I found really helpful through the IRS guidance is they did go ahead and, and give some scenarios. So it's really helped us out in particular situations. Um, the one that quickly comes to mind is retail. So retail can be a really tough bar to meet when it comes to um, qualifying based on, on restrictions. So the IRS did a, a really good job of, of laying out some scenarios and, and which qualify and which don't. All right, so let's Let's talk about a, a few definitions that'll serve us as we continue to talk about the program. Um, when it comes to that that suspension and, and the suspension of operations, uh, it, what will qualify wouldn't simply be a recommendation. So if, if a governor got up in a press conference and said, you know, I, I really urge the public to to stay home and to not not to go into restaurants and not to go into bars, you know, that alone would not qualify under the suspension of operation provisions within the, the IRS code here and through this program. It would really require the government the governor issuing an executive order or passing a law or passing a mandate. It has to be something actually documented and official. It can't simply be a recommendation from a government official. Whether or not the, the business was sufficiently restricted due to COVID-19 mandates and restrictions, a company can still qualify based on a decline in gross receipts as well. So it, you can kind of mix and match. If you, you don't have to qualify for both, provided you qualify for one or the other, then you have eligibility. Also, um, you may have eligibility based on gross receipts for a certain period of time, and then um, gross receipts are back up and no longer eligible and you may have had restriction eligibility. So you can certainly mix and match from time period to time period as, as appropriate and compliant. All right, so as promised, let's, let's talk a little bit about how the programs differ from 2020 to 2021. So first is, is the program's definition of large employer. So when you're coming up with your employee count for purposes of this, what you want to do is look at the calendar year 2019. And you simply want to count the number, month by month average, number of employees who average 30 or more hours per week um, in 2019. You don't have to worry about um, full time equivalents or anything like that, like you do with the Affordable Care Act. If someone averages 20 hours per week, you don't have to count them in this this number. It's strictly a, the amount of employees that work more than 30 hours per week. Um, if that number is over 100 in 2019, then you're considered a large employer for 2020. Um, it has to be over 500 employees in 2021 for you to be considered large. And why this large employer designation is important is it affects what you can claim for ERTC. So if you are a large employer, if you're over these employee headcount numbers for full-time workers, um, your ERTC eligibility is limited to pay provided to employees who are not performing any work. So for businesses considered small, you can have employees who you had working, you had employed, you were paying wages to, and if you are otherwise eligible, you can claim credits on those wages. If you're considered a large employer, you can only claim credits for money you paid to employees who weren't working. So the way that this has most often come up in my experience is usually earlier on in the pandemic, 
if employees were being furloughed and they were either being still still paid or um, you're also allowed to count the employer portion of health insurance. So there are some situations with large employers where um, they had a furlough going on. So employees were not performing work, but they were, were receiving compensation in the form of staying on the company health insurance and receiving the employer paid portion of that. Um, and when it's a large business, sometimes the the volume of that warrants still filing a claim and getting a decent size ERTC credit as a result of that. And for both years, you are always looking at 2019 as your reference here, even for the 2021 program. For the gross receipts decline, um, again, you're always comparing against 2019. So same rule applies there. What you would need to show to qualify under gross receipts. So for quarters in 2020, you would go quarter by quarter and look for quarters where the gross receipts in 2020 were a 50% or greater decline from the gross receipts in 2019. For the 2021 program, um, again, comparing against 2019, you would need to have at least a 20% decline in gross receipts from a quarter in 2021 to the same quarter in 2019. There's also a heightened tax credit itself within the 2021 program. So for 2020, the credit is 50% of each employee's wages up to $10,000, which uh, again equals $5,000 per employee. And for 2020, um, no matter how many quarters you're eligible, the max you can get for each employee for the entire 2020 program is $5,000. For 2021, they increased the credit to 70% of wages up to $10,000, so up to $7,000 per employee. And they also designed the 2021 ERTC to essentially be a separate program each quarter. So for each quarter that you are eligible, you can claim up to $7,000 per employee. So as a result, should you be eligible in quarters one, two, and three of 2021, you can get up to $21,000 per employee for that year. In terms of the potential eligibility period, so really the ERTC program for all intents and purposes in terms of uh, wages and dates, starts on March 13th of 2020 and runs through the end of that year. The 2021 ERTC runs from January 1st of that year through the end of third quarter or September 30th. In terms of what counts as qualified wages, um, it's, it's a pretty long list. So salaries, hourly wages, commissions, Tips also. So for restaurant clients, that's been that's been big. They you can count tips as ERTC eligible wages within this program. In terms of that gross receipts definition and determining whether or not there was a sufficient decline, you basically include all your total sales and all amounts received for any services. Also includes interest, dividends, rents, royalties, annuities. So it's a a pretty exhaustive list in terms of determining your gross receipts. So should you potentially have a decline in gross receipts? This is this is how, how we look at it. So what we do is we identify the first or the earliest quarter in which that 50% or greater decline in gross receipts occurred. You then maintain an eligibility until you have a quarter where the gross receipts decline was less than 20%. You still have eligibility for that quarter. You just lose it for the quarter following. So let's take a look at that. I know that's really confusing. So let's take a look at it in kind of an example form here. So um, for our example employer here, in quarter two of 2020, they had a 52% decline. In quarter three of 2020, they only had a 17% decline. And in quarter four of 2020, they only had an 8% decline. In this instance, our, our example client here would qualify for Q2. There was that 50% or greater decline. They would also qualify for Q3 because this eligibility would carry over. Because the drop was less than 20% in this quarter three here, 
this would be their last quarter of eligibility in 2020. Um, they would not be able to claim ERTC in Q4. You see a note here about the preceding quarter rule. This comes into play for 2021 quarters. So for eligibility under gross receipts decline in 2021, you go by either that current quarter being down 20% or more, or you can use the preceding quarter rule, which means you can lean on the previous quarter. So what I mean by that is to be eligible for quarter two of 2021, Either your quarter two 2021 gross receipts need to show a 20% or greater decline against quarter two of 2019, or if your quarter one gross receipts show a 20% or greater decline against quarter one of 2019, um, you can use that to be eligible for quarter two as well. All right, so some frequently asked questions that we get often. Um, there, there is a bit of a waiting game when it comes to receiving the funds. So it's exciting. We, we go through the process, we exclude PPP funds and everything that we need to and, and come up with some, some credit numbers. And um, to be honest, oftentimes there, you know, can oftentimes be a great deal of money, uh, a lot of excitement there and um, you're pretty much hurrying up to wait. So you amend the forms, you send them in, and then you're just kind of monitoring the IRS transcripts, waiting for those refunds to come. So it is very much a old fashioned by paper, by snail mail process. Uh, the IRS has not done much, at least that's client facing to, to really automate the process. So they are not allowing e-filing of the 941 X's um, nor electronic submission of any sort. Uh, also, they're not direct depositing the refunds once they are issued. They're sending those by paper check. So um, really the process is you amend a, a, the 941 on paper, you send it in the mail, they receive it, they get to processing it, uh, then they approve it, issue the refund, they send you out an overpayment letter to, to detail the amount of your credit plus any interest that'll be added to it, and then follow that up with a, a paper check sent to your address on file with the IRS. This is one that, that'll come up somewhat often. Does an employer need to prove that their significant decline in gross receipts is related to COVID-19? So the answer to that is no. Um, and we, we've had some eligibility that way. So this is oftentimes or, or sometimes come up in, in a control group situation. So um, there might be a person that owns owns three businesses or, or did prior to the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, they they sold off one of the businesses or one of the locations, whatever it may be. Um, that's going to show likely show a decline in gross receipts because when the three locations were open, let's say gross receipts were, were $3 million. Um, and then all of a sudden you sold off one or two of those and then the gross receipts are $1 million. That, that's a decline, even though it may not be COVID related. And again, I, I think we, we covered this, but in terms of determining the employee counts and whether you're a large or small employer, you take a look at your employees who average 30 or hour, more hours per week or 130 or more hours per month for each month of 2019 and then, and then get your monthly average to come up with your number. Another question that I guess fortunately comes up because a lot of times um, the amount of the ERC credit will exceed the actual tax liabilities that they owed for a given quarter in terms of your em employer Social Security and Medicare tax. Um, the good news is, is that ERC is a refundable, advanceable tax credit, which means even if the amount exceeds the amount that you paid in taxes for that quarter, you're still going to receive the full calculated amount. I think we discussed this as well, but um, this this is really important to ha have a good handle on. Um, when it comes to the fuller partial suspension of operations, you have to look at, at that nominal definition and, and you really have to look at what the IRS considers sufficient. So some things that don't meet the bar, um, things like masking requirements, yeah, you know, 
pretty much every business was impacted by COVID in, in one way or another. It's really a matter, did it rise to the level of a suspension of operations or at least a full or partial one? So things like masking mandates, uh, vaccination requirements, things like that, those don't don't rise to that level. What you're more looking for is restrictions on on occupancy, um, restrictions on the time that you're allowed to be open, the you know having to space in a way that's going to require you to alter your schedule. So, professional service firms, you know, thinking about massages and salons and things like that, when the distancing requirements require them to move chairs or remove some chairs and have to alter their schedule so they could see fewer clients in a given day. You know, that more speaks to to a restriction than, you know, someone who's saying, well, we all had to wear masks and certain clients didn't like that, so they didn't come in. Um, you really have to treat these on a case-by-case -case basis and really have a, a good sense of knowledge where where the IRS stands on these things. Um, and they are getting getting particular, like we'll talk about in a minute. So Definitely be wary of of anyone you talk to that kind of just says, "Yeah, you are restricted. We're gonna you're eligible for all all quarters of the program from Q2 2020 all the way through Q3 of 2021." Um, oftentimes, that isn't the case. You know, even even for a program who is really designed for, like a restaurant. So I know I've mentioned this often, but assuming there isn't a decline in gross receipts. And let's talk about Massachusetts here. So Massachusetts definitely had restrictions on on restaurants, but those were lifted in March, uh, May 29th of 2021. So for a restaurant to be eligible beyond May 29th, so in order for them to get that quarter three eligibility, they essentially have to show a decline in gross receipts because the things that would qualify as a suspension of operations really um, were lifted two thirds of the way through quarter two. That also brings up another question that comes up often um, in terms of the time frame. So if you're qualifying based on gross receipts decline, your eligibility extends for the entire quarter. If you're qualifying solely on a, on a suspension of operations, it really has to do with the dates of the specific order. So in that example there that I used of May 29th, uh, those businesses are not necessarily eligible for the entire Quarter two. If they didn't have sufficient gross receipts decline, their eligibility would end at the end date of that restriction or May 29th. So they'd only be able to claim credit on wages paid through that date. Um, on the MP website, we do have some decision trees that, that may or may not be helpful for you. Uh, I found them to be be very helpful, really helps you kind of walk through your situation. And again, there is there is some gray area, especially when you're talking about that suspension of operation. So it is best to, to consult with someone um, who, who knows the program fairly well, but these can be a really great tool to give you an initial idea if you may have eligibility um, for one of the program, one or both of the program years. All right, so let's talk about uh, a few different scenarios. Um, we'll talk about a nonprofit educational program. So think maybe like a, a tutoring or a, a company that goes into schools and, and works with children in need. So um, in their situation, some of their services were done remotely. Others were, were canceled during restrictions because they had to be done in person. They couldn't be done via Zoom, um, hands-on learning or a group session or something like that. Um, let's also talk about a brewery. So this brewery has a fairly large um, three production facilities in three states. One of the locations has a tap room. That tap room was forced closed through quarter two of 2021. They weren't allowed to have people at the bar. Um, but because of takeout and being able to sell six packs and kegs, their gross receipts were actually up. And then finally, let's talk about a tech company. So this tech company... Um, required all office employees uh, to work from home. Let's say that was a governmental mandate um, that in their state offices were forced closed. Um, but these tech workers were able to do their jobs from home um, and that they ended up remaining remote even after restrictions were lifted. 
Um, so in these scenarios, the nonprofit educational program, assuming that the in-person learning that had to be suspended and couldn't be continued because the school was mandated closed or whatever it may be, assuming that was more than a nominal portion or more than 10% of the program, they would be eligible during that time when they were not allowed to be on site. Um, this happens a lot with you know, boys and girls clubs and, and things like that, where they would have in-person activities or sports programs or activity programs for the time period that those weren't allowed, even if they were doing some virtual programming or maybe even having people in, they just weren't allowed to have the group activities, provided those were more than nominal, then uh, they oftentimes have, have great eligibility. Our brewery example, so again, uh, provided they're not considered a large employer based on their size, um, for this example, let's say they're not, because that tap room was mandated closed, they weren't allowed to have people in their tasting room, they weren't allowed to be serving drafts to people, um, the entire operation would qualify, even, even the manufacturing facility in the other state or the brewery in the other state. It's all part of the same ownership group. And assuming that tap room accounted for at least 10% of sales or 10% of staffing overall, uh, then they would qualify. And then the tech company, on the other hand, likely would not. So again, almost every company was impacted in some way by COVID. Um, some were able to pivot better than others, but for businesses and for jobs where there was an equivalency in terms of the work being done that could be done virtually and done remotely. Um, if companies, and to their credit, a lot of companies got super creative. It's been awesome working with these businesses and hearing about new ways that they got the same job done or new business ventures that they tried or new new services that they offered in light of the pandemic. Um, companies got really, really creative and it, it really um, was a, a great you know, unfortunately, the reasoning behind it was out of necessity, but we really saw some great entrepreneurship and, and great professional creativity during the pandemic. Um, but in this case here, based on what we know from this little blurb, if the employees were able to continue business as usual from home, um, then that would not count as a suspension of operations under IRS guidelines. All right. A few more examples here. Um, so let's talk about controlled ownership. So a husband and wife fully own an auto body shop and a restaurant. That auto body shop accounts for 70% of their revenues and was an essential business, not subject to restriction. So in this case, um, the husband and wife you know, share each other's ownership. So collectively, they own 100% of the business. They cannot be counted as eligible as employees nor if they have any children or other family members of any sort. Um, and the list of eligible family members is, is pretty long. Uh, you'll wanna double check that. But um, they and their family members are excluded, but because 30% of revenues were attributed to the restaurant, they, they're, all of their employees, including the employees of the garage, the essential business, would be eligible for the time period that the restaurant is eligible due to restrictions. Um, let's talk about a gym. Um, so three college friends, not related, just friends, each own one third of the company and they are on the payroll. In this scenario, we would be able to claim credits on all three of those owners as well as any family members they have because there is not one owner or related owners that own 51% or more of the business. So in this case, they each own 33 and a third percent. They're good to go. We can claim credits on their wages. And lastly, let's talk about a, a museum or a cultural center. So they they scrambled. Um, they had a, a great community of patrons. Um, and through their fundraising and through some grants they were able to avail themselves of, they avoided losses during the time that they were restricted and, and couldn't have people in the museum. Um, restrictions were lifted for them in this example on June 1st of 2021. Um, but because people were reluctant to come back um, because of COVID or for whatever the reason was, their revenues then fell. They were not getting that same fundraising or those same grants. So their revenues fell in Q2 and Q3 of 2021. So um, this is one of those mix and match scenarios. So they would likely be eligible based on restrictions through 6-1. Um, and then their eligibility would continue 
for the rest of Q2 and for Q3 based on the gross receipts. So they, they would be an example of a business that was eligible for the entire potential eligibility period. So before we go into the IRS update, just some takeaways that hopefully you have from uh, the conversation thus far. First, just understand that there are some similarities, but also some really key differences between 2020 ERC and 2021 ERC. Um, make sure you know how to properly calculate your employer size and what that means if you, um, whether you're large or small. Do make sure you're doing a proper uh, calculation of your gross receipts so that you can truly know whether you're eligible based on that potential avenue. Do understand or at least know who to talk to in terms of understanding that suspension of operations eligibility. Again, it is a fairly high bar and the IRS is looking for people making fraudulent claims. Know the owner limitations, that whole 51% or greater rule as well as family members. Know the aggregation rules in terms of uh, collective ownership of multiple businesses. Um, do understand how the PPP works. So we didn't get into this too much in this presentation, but Really, what, what you have to do to avoid double dipping is, you know, the document that we always really want is the forgiveness application. So if you recall, you filed an application to receive PPP funds, you put in some supporting payroll data, um, got the funds, and then as you use them and as you applied for forgiveness, you submitted what was called a forgiveness application. So that forgiveness application is really key to being able to maximize credits under this program, because what it does is it tells us the amount of your PPP, it tells us what you used um, as your, as your uh, measurement period for the PPP, and also lets us know if you used 100% of those funds on payroll, or if you used a, a portion of those on payroll and a portion on something else. So really what we need to exclude are um, the funds that were used for payroll during your covered period. So um, if that's 100%, then we need to exclude 100% of your PPP, provided your covered period lines up with your eligibility period under this program. If instead you only used 70% of the PPP on payroll and the other 30% was on other expenses, utilities, rent, what have you, um, we only need to exclude that 70%. So it's really important that we have that data. We can work before the PPP period and after it. Um, to really maximize your credits, assuming you're eligible on both sides of it. Do make sure you're keeping proper substantiation of, of your claim. So um, for clients who choose to work with MP, part of our process is, you know, we do a consultation with you. We work really hard. We, we figure out what your eligibility period is and what we can safely assume you'll um, be eligible for. And then once we do all the calculations and factor in the PPP and, and take a look at the payroll data and come up with those numbers, we then create what we call a substantiation document, which outlines your credit amount, how we arrived at those numbers and what your basis for eligibility was. So whether that be gross receipts decline or um, eligibility under suspension of operations and really outlining what those laws were, or what those rules were, you know, at the state level, at the city level, what the dates were, what the number of the executive order was, you really want to have that all. So that doesn't get submitted when you file the claim. You're really just filing tax forms to, to claim the credit. It's that if you get questioned or audited by the IRS, there's a, a really long and, and detailed questionnaire that you have to fill out if you are audited. And so it's it's going to be really important that you have all your ducks in a row because just naturally as humans, the more time that goes by, I mean, we're talking about stuff that happened three plus years ago at this point. So it's hard to remember some of those things and we can all remember being impacted, but, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember that, you know, the world was really, or the U.S. at least was really shut down from March of 2020, you know, well into the summer. So, um, having those details and having the specifics about the laws is, is really important. So that's something that, that we provide to our clients. And um, should you have done this work with someone else or anything like that, make sure they're giving you something that will really aid you in the event of an audit. Uh, number nine, it isn't too good to be true. Um, you know, some of the promises that, that some people make with this are too good to be true. If, if you're not eligible, you're not eligible. This isn't a program that every business is entitled to by any means, but for businesses that 
that did suffer during the pandemic, either financially or, or based on restrictions. Uh, this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to get a, a really potentially substantial amount of, of legitimate funds from the government. And then finally, number 10, you know, we, we do urge patience. So the IRS, you know, has admitted they've gotten way more uh, participation in this program than they were anticipating, you know, by, by several fold, uh, their, their estimations and their budgets and their staffing to handle the claims um, was not sufficient for the demand that came in. So they've been working from a, a really enormous backlog for some time now. Um, so it, it does take them some time. It, it ebbs and flows. Sometimes there'll be a period where things take a long, long time. Then there'll be a, a period where things are um, being run, refunded more quickly. Um, but overall, patience is, is the key in, in getting these funds. So speaking of patients, um, that's really important right now. And, and you may or may not have heard, but the IRS did put out a press release last week. Um, and essentially what they're doing is they're temporarily pausing uh, the processing of ERC claims um, this year. So um, in the press release, they, they explain that you know, they're really concerned that there are a lot of fraudulent and kind of fly-by-night tax credit companies popping up, um, soliciting businesses, targeting businesses that are not eligible, telling them that they are and getting them to file this. Those businesses are getting you know, money under this program, but these companies are then charging exorbitant fees, you know, upwards of 25% of the credit for the to the tax credit company. So um, IRS is really concerned about this. It's also obviously stre stressing their resources, preventing rightful claimants of this program from getting a timely processing of their claims. So what the IRS is doing is temporarily halting new applications um, for businesses that had already submitted. Those are going to continue to be processed, albeit they said it, it might be a little bit slower than usual. And what they're doing is um, instituting some safeguards, some additional review, um, some additional scrutiny of claims to hopefully weed out some of those bad actors uh, and some of the, the fraud that is, is happening. So, you know, what do we do from here? For us at MP, it, it's business as usual. So, um, as was said in the introductory slide, we've been in business nearly 20 years. Um, I've been at the company for, for nearly 10. I'm not going anywhere. MP isn't going anywhere. Um, we want to, you know, we went into this, you know, first and foremost, going at it from an ethical angle. We didn't want to be overly aggressive. We wanted to be able to sleep at night. We wanted our clients to be able to sleep at night. So we're not really changing what we're doing. Um, we're not concerned about anything that we filed thus far. We've had zero claims rejected as ineligible and we don't plan to have any. Um, we've been fortunate enough to help businesses realize over $130 million in ERTC credit so far and, and hope to have many more. Um, so what we're doing is we're continuing to consult with clients, we're continuing to calculate credits and we're continuing to submit those to the IRS. So um, our thought is let's get those in, let's get them over to them so that once they do resume, with those additional safeguards in place, our clients will be at the front of the line. All right. So it looks like we do have some questions. Let me dig into those. All right, so some good ones here. What if we had two plants and had to shut one of our plants down to due to losing a contract? We were having supply issues at the ports and couldn't get product. We didn't have revenue losses that year, but did have to shut one of our plans down. Um, less than 20 employees. Great question. So obviously a lot to unpack here and um, a lot of a lot of detail that we would probably want to gather to fully determine it, but I'll, I'll kind of answer a couple of those points. Um, first of which is, is the shutdown. So yeah. So many businesses, especially those that rely on, on others or rely on the general public for their business, you know, they were dealing with what people were comfortable with. So um, yeah, you know, let's use the auto body shop like we were talking about before. You know, people weren't weren't having to go to work as often or they were working from home. People, you know, car repairs, you know, weren't happening as often as they were before the pandemic, or people weren't feeling comfortable coming into to a garage, let's say they might have been putting things off. Things like personal preference or other businesses closing down, things like that, 
don't qualify under the suspension of operations, instead what we'd have to point to is, is an actual law or restriction as to um, why we had to shut a plant down or why we couldn't proceed because the government was telling us we weren't allowed to or weren't allowed to at, at sufficient capacity. The supply chain is, you know, a, a viable thing, albeit a really tough one. And um, I know a lot of auditors look look at supply chain disruption very skeptically, but uh, we have had a handful of clients who have legitimately qualified based on supply chain. So in order to qualify for ERTC based on supply chain, so what, what this would be is gross receipts weren't down. We ourselves were not specifically restricted in our work based on COVID mandates, but we we fell short because of, you know, we couldn't get the supplies or we couldn't get the product that we need to, to continue. What you would need to do to have a legitimate case under supply chain disruption would be that whoever your supplier is would have to have been restricted themselves. So uh, I'll use an example that we dealt with recently. Um, we worked with a company that is kind of a, a supplier and provides product to other businesses. And the supplier where they get this product was located in New Jersey. Now, New Jersey had some really strict COVID restrictions for a long period of time where even in the manufacturing sector, provided that the manufacturing was not considered essential, and in, in this example, it wasn't, um, that they really had to restrict. They had spacing requirements. They had staffing requirements in New Jersey and, and other restrictions. Um, dividers and all that where this manufacturing facility in, in New Jersey just could not produce the amount of product that they were con contracted to do because of those restrictions. So in turn, their orders were short of our client and what they needed to for their supplies to provide to their clients. And so thus, uh, a supply chain restriction was, was valid in their case. Um, so what you would really need to do is work with those suppliers and find out were they restricted you know, under a legitimate COVID restriction, and if so, what that was, and you'd really want your substantiation document to point to those COVID specific restrictions that your supplier faced. Um, some of the things that haven't qualified under that umbrella have been, hey, you know, my supplier fell short because they they weren't able to find any drivers or their employees weren't comfortable coming into the manufacturing facility because of COVID, but they were allowed to, they just didn't feel comfortable. Or, you know, we had a ton of turnover or, um, you know, our supplier couldn't get employees because no one would wear a mask, things like that. It, it has to be a specific code restriction um, that the supplier faced. What if you are a sales group and your customers did not allow you to visit during a period of time due to COVID? So again, that, that really comes down to separating preference and comfortability versus government allowance. So uh, a lot of businesses you know, acted responsibly and said, hey, we're, we're going to shut our office down. We're not going to allow visitors in out of an abundance of caution. We don't want anyone here getting sick. We, we care about our staff um, and, you know, from a humanitarian perspective, that's that's likely the right move. Um, but if you're in a situation where if both parties were comfortable, you were allowed to have these meetings, you were allowed to get together, you were allowed to do these activities. Um, if the government allowed it and you, you know, one party or the other just didn't feel comfortable with it, that would not qualify as a as a COVID restriction and uh, ERTC eligibility. All right, another question about lack of inventory or goods or availability of goods. Again, it would really depend on who that provider was and whether or not they were restricted. And also the IRS added another wrinkle to that. Is it something you could have procured from somewhere else? So in, in my New Jersey clients example there, um, it was a proprietary product they were having manufactured. So they there weren't other providers of it available to them. Uh, question here, do you perform your evaluation for a flat fee or a percentage of the potential credit? So um, our our fee is is based on a percentage of the credit. It's, it's a small percentage, um, and we do not charge anything for the consultation. We don't charge anything at the time of filing. We do not bill for our ERTC services until you have your check in hand from the IRS, and then we, we settle up at that point. So we don't charge anything up front. You know, it isn't until you have that money in hand that we that we charge a fee. And then should, in the unlikely event you get audited, we do provide support 
in at that time too, in terms of responding to the questionnaire and, and helping you through that. Which reports can I use to show a loss on gross receipts? So it depends on what type of business you are. Uh, it can be a, a P&L, a profit and loss statement. Uh, if you are a nonprofit, um, you're going to want to use the gross receipts figures that you used on your Form 990, you know, that tax filing. So um, a profit and loss statement is, is generally sufficient to show that gross receipts decline. Does a real estate LLC that had rental apartments and rental properties that lost income due to no one showing up to see the units, <coughs> excuse me, and loss of rents due to contractors not willing to come to work and complete the rental units qualify? So it does, again, we'd be happy to talk about your specific situation. Based on the facts here, there wouldn't be eligibility based on, on restriction. Again, these are are people not showing up that they were allowed to show up they just chose not to um but if the if those loss in rents and the loss in revenues was enough uh, especially compared to 2019 to qualify based on gross receipts decline then you may have eligibility there all right so it looks like those are the majority of the questions that we have and it also looks like we're we're coming up on the end of the hour here uh lauren can i hand it back over to you Thank you, Paul and Mike. To learn more about MP's full service solutions, I just dropped a link in the chat that will connect you with an MP team member. You can also visit our website at mp-hr.com for more information. Be sure to join us for our upcoming webinar, the 2023 New York Legislative Update going over regulatory alerts and guidance. Visit our website to register and see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. Once again, we will be sending out a recording of today's webinar with the presentation slides this afternoon. Thanks for joining us and have a terrific day.